How's it going, everybody? Dave Meltzer here, finishing up the week here on Wrestling Observer Live. We've got Brian Alvarez, Figure Four Weekly, here for two hours. We're also going to be joined by Sheldon Goldberg, New England promoter, wrestling historian, wrestling writer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He'll be up in a little while. And, uh, Brian, how are you today? I'm doing good. How's the media? The media? The media. The media. Every day. Every news story. Starts in Seattle. Uh, I have not even been following it today. I just totally gave up. Oh, okay. Although I did notice, I was like flipping through the channels last night, and um, I can't even remember what show it was, but there was some comedy show, and they were totally making fun of the earthquake coverage up here. And I thought, there you go. At least someone else noticed. Okay. Well, let's see. What else? Smackdown, last night. I liked the show last night. Yeah, it was a good show. Yeah. You know what I was surprised... Uh, with one of the best things in the show, at least I thought, was Benoit and Eddie Guerrero having that argument. Before the match. Yeah, I mean, the way it started out, it was kind of like, you know, this isn't too good, but by the end, it was like, that was really awesome. Yeah. You know, the weakest thing was the, uh, the thing Waller scripted. Oh, yeah, the, I, oh that, I know, that was the thing idiot. In the, ri- in the ring, I mean, I hit that fast forward, and I just, just couldn't, you know? It was really I mean, bad. I was in there, and I was just like, I'm bored with this. I want to watch something else. I actually watched the whole thing. Can you believe that? Yeah. It was horrible. I mean, yeah, just the, was... the acting and the whole concept of it. And I was just sitting there going, you know, I they really just got to end this RTC thing. It, it's so dumb. I yeah. see absolutely no upside. Well, they got the lawsuit, so they're not getting hurt that much by the guy anymore. But, but it's just, you know, I mean, I just found it so boring. Yeah. That's about the only thing on the show I would say that about. I thought it was very, you know, good show. Almost all the wrestling was real good. Yeah, yeah. You know, some stuff, you know, uh, I mean, some of the stuff was too short, but some of it, you know. But yeah, Rock and Regal was real short. I don't know if it was because he was still, uh, his neck still bothering him or what, but. Yeah, he's not 100% yet. Yeah. So, um, Angle and uh, Austin was real good. You know, they they definitely turned the corner on the Angle personality. Yes, they did. Yeah, it's kind of I mean, funny how they, uh, they're they mentioning in commentary, like, over the last week. And I'm thinking, you know, you guys had so much time to do this. You know, you gave them the title, and now you're feeling bad. Now you decide to do something. Isn't it interesting? What took you so long? Isn't it interesting that he held the title for so long, and they made him, and, and, and as a champion, he was put in a position of not being a great champion, even though he had the ability to be a great champion. And then all of a sudden, to give him the character that would have made him a great champion, they start the day after, he's no longer champion. Actually, I, I will go as far as to tell uh, to say that they gave it to him, uh, the, uh, the SmackDown before. I think they kind of started then. Okay, okay, you're right. But you're still, right. it's way, way too late. After four months... Well, it's not too late. He's got, like, you know, a huge career ahead of him. Oh, yeah, but... I mean, as far as, as far as doing it to give him some credibility at the right time, it was, you know, why wait so long? I just don't get it. I kind of get it, but uh, I kind of don't. Yeah. Uh, let's see what other stuff we have. Uh, some, uh, Sunday. Oh, by the way, for the first yes. time ever, they started airing the uh, thing with Rusty Tillman, and you know, uh, it aired. It aired. Um, it aired all the time. It aired all through the show on Monday too. Yeah, I mean, it's, it was the first time that I actually started to watch part of it. I watched yeah. like uh, two minutes, and as you know, I'm not a football fan, but I thought that was so stupid. So I fast forwarded through the rest. It's terrible, but I guess we'll see tomorrow night. Uh, you know what kind of audience it draws, if any? None. For the, for the New York, was it New York LA game? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I'll watch. I, I think I can't even watch that whole game. <sighs> I'm supposed to uh, go over some friend's house. I think I'm going to get through the first half, and that's about it. If I'm lucky, may not may not even get that. I got a lot of tapes to catch up on too. Mm-hmm. Got a New Japan pay per view, that Ohio Valley Big Show. So um, it's not going to be high there on the priorities. SmackDown did a 4.5 rating, which is the same as it did last week, which actually is probably a little less impressive because Friends and uh, Friends was in reruns, so they had a little bit easier competition. But uh, they didn't go up, but Survivor went way up. In fact, uh, let's see, uh, CBS beat NBC last night, which is, I think, the first time that's NBC's probably lost a Thursday night in, like, 50 years. I don't know, not quite that long, but in a long time. Hmm. 
As we already mentioned, the Dick Butkus will take Lawler's place. No one will miss Lawler in the XFL. They will in pro wrestling, though, but that's another story. Zero One had a pay-per-view today at Tokyo Sumo Hall. Sold out a crowd of 11,000. From what we understand, it was a really good show. Uh, it's the Shinya Hashimoto promotion. The key stuff, uh, Kazunari Murakami beat Shinjiro Otani with choke. Heard that was good. They did a big angle a couple days ago uh, to build that match up at the dojo when Murakami showed up and they got in a big fight. Uh, from all, from, not all Japan, from Noah, Yoshihiro Takayama and Takao Mori beat Alexander Otsuka of Battle Arts. That Otsuka, we'll talk about him in a second. And, and Tatsuhito Takeiwa, formerly of New Japan, who's really still of New Japan, in a quick match, like seven minute match. And then the main event, Misawa and uh, Jun Akiyama beat Shinya Hashimoto and Yuji Nagata in 19 minutes and 10 seconds when Misawa pinned Shinya Hashimoto with a released German suplex. Heard it was a really good match. Hmm. After the match, Naoya Ogawa came out and challenged Misawa to a match. And Misawa attacked Ogawa with forearms. And that's a match that will draw money. Um, God, I hate to be Misawa. That guy, that guy doing all that shoot stuff is banged up as Misawa is. But, but it's a money match. Yeah. And, Ka and Kazuki Fujita ran in and he and Jun Akiyama had a pull apart. And if anyone can get a good match out of Kazuki Fujita, it is Jun Akiyama. So it'll probably be really good. But uh, I heard that the, the very much compliments on the booking, because when the show was over, they said that, let's see, uh, people wanted to see Misawa Ogawa. I mean, they gave you a lot of stuff to look forward to. Akiyama Fujita, Nagata against Akiyama, did a lot of hot stuff. Misawa Hashimoto single match, which, of course, will be down the road. Hashimoto Ogawa, still more heat on that, which you can always do that match. You know, I mean, that's going to end up being a legendary feud. And Ogawa and Yuji Nagata, which... Which, uh, if nothing else, it's a great match. Any match with New Japan. You know what's interesting is, I mean, with like New Japan sending guys away to, uh, supposedly, uh, you know, convince people that are in other groups so they can do the interpromotional angle down the road, they're actually doing interpromotional angles by sending these guys away. Yeah. So, it's like great for business both, you know, short term and long term. Great for, uh, other people's business and their business. Yeah. Yeah, well, they've got they've got a lot of dome shows this year because it's the the 30th anniversary of the first the 30. Let me think this right. The beginning of the 30th year. I gotta get this right. So semantically get it wrong. The beginning of the 30th year of the New Japan promotion is uh, was it Tuesday? What day? The sixth. Tuesday, right? The sixth. Tuesday. Yeah. So that's the beginning where they have a show at Oda Ward Gym. So. As, as, as part of their 30th year celebration, they're going to have do a lot of dome shows this year. They're, in fact, they're having one on April the 9th and another one on May 5th. So they need a lot of dream matches coming up. Because, you know, them on their, you know, just New Japan, booking a dome and putting on a big show by itself is not going to draw anymore. So, um, I know they're going to, they're trying to do Mark Coleman and Yuji Nagata on, uh, at the Osaka Dome April 9th. And, um, I'm sure that some of these matches we've talked about, you know, they're looking at it for the April and the May, uh, dome shows. So, and they're going to do more dome shows, I think, later this year. I think they want to do Sapporo Dome. I don't know about Nagoya Dome. I haven't heard. It's a uh, very ambitious planning for this year. So, uh, anyway, it's a good pay-per-view to look forward to this one. This one, I can get a tape of this one, which will probably be in just a couple of days. Um, Otsuka, what I was going to say about Otsuka that's so interesting is, is this guy, it's like he does shoot fights, gets pounded on, and he just comes back and does his wrestling matches like nothing's wrong. He did. Did you ever hear the story of, um, I'm trying to remember which day this was. Um, I think that in one day, uh, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong about this, uh, as far as the opponent. I'm not wrong about the story. Um, he did a show at the Tokyo Dome. Okay, well, first of all, there was, there was, he set up the ring for a Cork and Hall show at noon. So he got up like at 6 in the morning, or whatever it was. Yeah, 6 in the morning, set up the ring. Did a tag match at Cork and Hall, just regular pro wrestling tag match. Do did topes everything, right? Comes back and does a shoot fight that night with Igor Bochanchin at the Tokyo Dome. Igor? Yes, I think it was Igor. Bo I could be wrong with the opponent. That's a hell of a day. It. it may have been Ken Shamrock. Uh, it was either Ken Shamrock or Igor. I forget which. Let's see. Either way, it's a tough fight. Um, well, he got he got pounded on in both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Ken knocked him out. Igor. Pounded him, but never put him away. Yeah, I think it was Igor, because I think it was the fight where he didn't get put away. Mm-hmm. 
So yeah, he went in there, and then he went in there and got pounded on. Did he have to take 20... the ring down after the uh, second fight? No. That would have been. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I mean, okay, so he does all that, and he gets pounded on for 20 minutes by Igor. Igor doesn't even put him away. That was his day. And anyway, this time, he had that fight in the uh, rainstorm Saturday night uh, and got pounded on by Guy Metzger. It was, he was bleeding like crazy. It was stopped on blood. And, you know, here, you know, a couple days later, he's out there doing pro wrestling matches again. It's like nothing ever happened. Yeah, I don't know. He's going to he's gonna end up with scrambled brains not too long if he doesn't have them already. Yeah. I mean, all that stuff, you know, we talk about, it's like, wow, isn't that cool? You know what, though? Man, it's not it's cool. It's not. It's not cool at all, no. Uh, let's see. There was actually an NHL hockey game, game three of the 2000 Stanley Cup, did a 2.3 rating, so there is actually a number that uh, the XFL has to try to beat this week. 2-3? 2-3. I predict yes. they'll do it. I predict they won't, so we'll see. I've been wrong every time on the XFL predicted <laughs> ratings. <laughs> every single week. Uh, this was Jesse Ventura's quote yesterday. Um, he's talking about the... <laughs> listen to this. The media... Okay, he's bl he blamed the media for the, um, for the XFL ratings. Okay? This is, this is his quote. They got embarrassed again. They thought this was going to be football players hitting each other over the head with chairs. They thought it was going to be wrestling on the football field. Then when they found out it wasn't, they had to attack it and say it's not as good as the NFL. It's second-rate football. Okay, now what? And what that is, caused millions caused really? and millions of viewers, nearly 56 million at one point, I believe, <laughs> yeah, to right. stop watching the games. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, now, okay. It's not as good. As, okay, now when he's mad because they're saying it's not as good as the NFL, it's like it's not. Like, like if you're going to criticize someone, you got to criticize them for something that they said wrong. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, but when he was asked about the future of the league, he goes, "I don't know. We'll give it our best shot." Which is that doesn't sound too confident. That's a. Uh, it's got yeah, a lot of confidence uh, there in that league. Boy, there's been a lot of people uh, being real confident of late in that. Uh, let's see. Here is the poll uh, for the best match of the year so far, starting in December. Uh, why the year starts in December, don't ask me. Actually, it's because, uh, basically, it's because when I did the Observer Newsletter, uh, the awards were always um, come out in January, and the feeling was is that, because when I started doing it, and even now, which is fair, is that people are usually several weeks behind in Japanese tapes, so therefore, to be fair, you cut it off December 1st. And also, because the voting starts December 1st, so... Anything in the month of December would be unfair because most of the people voting weren't going to be voting on it. Let's say there's a big pay-per-view match like the Hell in the Cell matches, for example. Middle of December, half those ballots are in, and they didn't count it, so it's unfair. So that's the reason. So anyway, that's why it starts in December. Was there a reason First you didn't do the cutoff date uh, January 1st? Yeah, because then I'd have to have the uh, awards issue in the middle of February, and then everybody else would already have their awards issues out. Okay. So you want to get the... Actually, PWI always had it first, but, you know, those were all worked awards anyway, so I never considered that, like, important. Uh -huh. um, and actually, when you look at their awards, there's probably a good reason I never considered them important. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, top candidate for match of the year, uh, Kawada and Fuchi against Izuka and, and Nagata from December New Japan pay-per-view, 9%, which actually I think was the best match so far. Hell in the Cell, 5%. Shocked the hell out of me. 5%. That was a hell of a match, to only get 5%. Mm -hmm. Ben Juan Jericho, ladder match, 36%. Helmsley and Austin from last Sunday, 45%. Kawada Sasaki Tokyo Dome, 5%. So that's that. Uh, today's poll for the weekend is, uh, what do you think about the WWF-Jerry Waller split? A, it's the best thing for the WWF. B, McMahon should call up Lawler and patch things up. Do not hold your breath, but if you think he should, you can vote it, but don't hold your breath waiting for it to happen. C, Lawler should call McMahon up and change his mind. Don't hold your breath on that one either, even if you think it's the best one. And D, Lawler should just forget the WWF and make a deal with WCW which may not be that easy either because they can't make deals today. Any thoughts on that? I don't even know what I would vote for. I guess I, I guess, well, I think they should just, uh, actually I should go over our poll. Um, do you think Jerry Lawler and Cat will end up back in the WWF? Cooler heads will prevail and they'll both be back, 9%. Cooler heads will prevail and they'll bring just Lawler back, 41%. And Vince is way too stubborn to back down, so they're gone Forty-nine point six percent. Okay. So very few people think that Cat's ever coming back. Basically. I yeah I don't think Cat's coming back either. Yeah. That's gonna be a tough. That'll be a tough one. 
So I, I would I would kind of agree on that. And I was sitting there, I was doing the, uh, I was trying to do, because remember we were talking about yesterday doing the poll for the website about uh, who should be his replacement. Yes. And I'm sitting there trying to think of all these names, and it really struck me that they need to bring him back. <laughs> I mean, either these names, there's no way they would ever do it, or I basically even ran out of, I had Bobby Heenan, Mark Madden, Joey Styles, Joel Gerdner, Tom Zane. Joey, but okay, 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 Styles is going to be a caller guy. So yes. Yeah. I I, that's why that's why I told this whole problem with this poll. I was going, who could they really bring in? They could bring in Bobby Heenan. They could bring in Larry Zabisco. Oops, I need I mean, to Larry on Gert, the poll. Gertner's, Gertner's obviously not ready for that. Yeah. There's no way. Yeah. Um, let me see who else. Um, I mean, they could bring someone from within, like, you know, Michael Hayes. Foley. Foley. Taz. Taz, certain, you know. Taz will probably be announcing on Monday, although no one knows for sure. Yeah. I mean, as far as Gertner, I think they should, if they, want, if they really wanted to... Uh, Eventually get Gertner in that spot. I mean, I would bring him in and have him do like just a Jack show or something like that. You know, one of the pre-taped shows, and um, you know, try and do it live to tape. You know, do like six months just doing it like he's doing in ECW. Then try six months live to tape, and then when he's ready, he'd be ready. But just to try and bring him straight into like a live RAW, there's just no way. The other thing with Gertner, I don't know appearance-wise. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, they're I mean they're kind of a stickler about that. I mean, I know some people who they considered and didn't, you know, basically won't consider uh, because of appearance. You know? I mean, mm-hmm. for years. I mean, hey, they never gave Finkel a chance. Yeah. And Finkel was a better announcer than almost every announcer they had when, when he, in the early, in the mid-80s, I'm talking about. I remember, like, for whatever reason, somebody was gone and Finkel had to do a show and I was listening to it and it's like, you know, he, he's better than all their announcers. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and I asked about that and it was just like, well, you know, it's just not in the cards for Howard Finkel. Yeah. So, so and that's 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 how they are. By the way, I did get an email yesterday. The commentator here's the wrestling, Randy Rosenblum. Oh yeah, I got a million of those emails. Oh yeah. my god, that guy was hideous. Yeah, he was. He was not included on the list on the website, by the way, for uh, possible replacements. Well, it's because he's it's impossible. Uh, what about? I don't know. No, Albano was not there either. Sorry. Uh, well, I, I can't ima- I cannot imagine them bringing him back. It would get a pop. You know, but you really—I th- don't even know if it'd get a pop. It would. It would. Um. Okay. Only if it was in the right city, it'd have to be in the Northeast. You're, if it was somewhere besides the Northeast, you're probably right. Yeah, yeah. But in the Northeast, it's like one of those names that, like, even the like, if you live in the Northeast, I think that like you're a kid, even if you never actually saw Albano in the WWF, it's like you heard the name. Like, it's like Bruno San Martino. It's like yeah. you heard the name so much that that you must think he's important. Yeah. You know. But it would have to be the right. I'm just thinking back to like, remember when they. Uh, I think it was Howard Finkel, actually, came out to the Ultimate Warriors music. And when the music started playing, everyone in the audience just sat there like, what the hell is this? Didn't even recognize the music. Yeah. I went for the day when Hogan comes back, and uh, they play his real American music, and everyone expects Pat Patterson. It's Pat Patterson and Jerry Briscoe. Yep. Yeah. I think if he comes back, they won't play that music. And again, who knows? Who knows with Hogan? Uh, let's see. What about Howard Finkel? We just mentioned him. People are reading my mind now. Can you get him on the show? Let's see. As soon as we can get people from the WWF on the show, it's going to come down to the first request, either Kurt Angle, Christian, and Howard Finkel. Okay? Uh, let's see. How about Jim Mitchell? That name's been bandied about. Don't know. Do you, I know the WWF is looking for new writers. and Paul Heyman, do you know when they will be hiring more people up to the writing staff? Uh, but Monday, I don't know, whenever Hayden comes in. Uh, let's see. Uh, what do you think of the chances of Eric attempting to s- sign Val Venus? He's the one guy who's not mean of being in the WF that could have a tremendous impact on WCW with his all-around talent. Signing uh, his con- him. His contract's going to be up in, like, a hundred years, right? <laughs> <laughs> his well, he did get to the RDC. Yeah. Uh, gosh, let's see. Whatever happened to Wendy Richter? Was her final match in WF against Moolah a screw job? Yes, it was. And that's what happened to her. She was staying there in the gorilla position with Gorilla, ready to go to the ring. And, uh, the Spider Lady was in the ring. And the Spider Lady was, I don't even know who was playing Spider Lady in all the, in the house shows. But it was not Moolah. And, God, who was, I don't even remember. So anyway, he hands her a contract and goes sign it. You know, you got to sign this this contract, and she goes, uh, "I got to have my lawyer look at it." 
And then her match was like ready to start, her music's playing. So she leaves. And she gets double crossed and pinned, and when she comes back, it's like, well, I guess there's no contract. <laughs> I mean, think about this. Was that 88? Uh, I think that was earlier than that. I think it was probably 80, I'm guessing 86. Okay, 86. And Mula is what, 74 now? Some, okay, something like that. Mula was very old. So she's like almost 60 years old. Yeah, yeah, she was really old when she, she, yeah, but it's sort of like you're just working a match and she just grabbed like a, like a, what was like an inside cradle and just held on tight and then just wouldn't let her go. Yeah. So it's like, and you're not really trying, you know what I mean? It wasn't like they had to shoot. Yeah. It was just like, they, you know, they asked Mula like, you know, and Mula, you know, Mula's been in the ring for 40, for 40 years by then anyway, so she knew the tricks in the position. It was, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now what I thought, think is very strange is Richter supposedly not knowing that it was Mula the whole match. That's yeah, a little suspicious. Yeah. That part's suspicious. Especially if the person that uh, originally played the Spider Lady was uh, nowhere near 60 years old. No, no, she was probably like in her 20s or early 30s. I just thought she didn't put on any lotion that afternoon. <laughs> no, she wore a whole bodysuit. You couldn't see her legs or arms, nothing. Hmm. I remember. I still that. think that's kind of suspicious. I, I, I thought that she didn't know it was Mula was suspicious. The rest of the story, I mean, it's. Pretty much. True. I mean, half the time when someone's in a mask or in a body, just look at Ray Jr. Just looking at him, you could tell who it was. I would imagine not only not being able to look at them and know, but actually be wrestling them. Well, especially because Richter wrestled Mula a million times. I mean, uh -huh. so many horrible matches. You would think she's like walks <laughs> up with her and go, I can smell it. It's Mula. I'm having a horrible match tonight. Not to mention um, calling spots in Mula's voice. Maybe Mula disguised her voice. No, no. I, I believe me. I don't see how she didn't know it was Mula. But as far as at that point, maybe she should have, like, just, I don't know. Nobody ever just, like, walks out and says, actually, I should take that back. If it was Brody, he would have just walked out of the ring and left. Because he did that. One time in, um, was it Min Minneapolis? He probably actually did it many times. Just, like, uh, supposed to do a job, and there was an argument about it, and instead of getting double-crossed, figuring the double-cross was coming, worked a few minutes, and then just walked to the back. Oh, there you go. So... Uh, I don't think that, uh, who knows, okay. For, for you to file away in the useless information department, viewer's choice is still listing, viewer's choice Canada is still listing the ECW pay-per-view on March 11, and the digital cable info for the show talks about top stars, just incredible, Rhino and Jerry Lynn, and you thought Heyman was the only one in denial. From what I understand from, this is, this is as of yesterday, uh, viewer's choice Canada was planning on doing a replay of the January pay-per-view in that time slot, and I don't know what in demand is planning on doing um, on March 11th, because they got it. You know, Heyman hasn't told anyone he's canceling. He's going he's gonna to win so many brownie points with these pay-per-view companies at the end of this week. Um, but I do know he, there were like certain deadlines for like, you know, the uh, pre-shows and stuff that he's missed. Mm -hmm. And then there's another deadline for like saying like who the production crew is going to be and, and location and stuff. And he missed that deadline too. But he actually has not canceled the show. This is like total stubbornness because, I mean, at the very least... I mean, why couldn't he just put together, like, a history of ECW pay-per-view and just go, you know, this is going to be the last one. It's going to be history of ECW, all your favorite stuff, you know, on pay-per-view. People buy it. Yeah, they would. It'd probably be pretty good, too. I mean, he'd get the sympathy buys and everything like that, and it'd do all right. S the sympathy buys. Uh, that's what it'd be, though. Really. <laughs> I'm serious, because, like, all sympathy my friends... Sympathy buys. Um, oh, it was like, I can't remember when it was, but, like, um, it was probably about a year ago, there was going to be an ECW pay-per-view. And, um, you know, usually we have a bunch of friends that get together at one place. And on this particular pay-per-view, everybody was feeling so bad, like this company was going to die, that I had, like, four friends buy it at four different houses to help the company. It was kind of strange. I was going, okay, well, you, your four buys aren't going to help, but still. <laughs> Sympathy buys. Not going to hurt. Just we like All Sheldon Japan. Goldberg. We got Sheldon Goldberg. Yeah, that's true. All Japan did have a month of sympathy business, but ultimately, now they're, in, now they're in the position they're in, though. Yeah. The sympathy just didn't last long enough. They tried to do that sympathy Tokyo Dome, and it was a little ambitious. Sheldon, how you doing? Good, Dave. Hopefully, uh, now that I'm on, people will have a sympathy listen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. This is more from Scott Keith. He goes, on the bright side, if I order the non-show, at least 22 hours for three hours of a blank screen would give me a better value for my, my money than the $25 I paid to watch the WoW pay-per-view. <laughs> That's pretty good. Oh, I don't feel what? sorry for anybody that bought that WoW pay-per-view. Like yeah. you didn't know it was going to be bad going in. Yeah. Sheldon, did you buy yes, the WoW pay-per-view? 
Excuse me? Did you watch the Wild pay-per-view? Uh, I have it here on tape. I, I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Okay. And what are your expectations of this show? Well, now that I've read what everybody's written about it, they're obviously not all that great, but, you know, it is what it is. I mean, you know, nobody expected to see, you know, uh... Nobody expected to see, like, an All Japan Women show, you know? Mm. How come, now that we're on the subject, how come, if WoW can get on the air, that somebody just didn't put All Japan Women on the air? They got a great TV. Every time I watch that TV show, I mean, now, even after 10 years, you know, mm -hmm. or actually 15 years I've been watching it, it still blows me away. It was on the air in this country at one point in time. Yeah, about 15 years ago it was on the yeah. air. Yeah. Yeah, during what? the heyday, as a matter of fact. You mean fact, just TV or pay-per-view? No, it was on uh, Weekly TV on um, the was Tempo Network. Score? What? It was on the Tempo Network. Tempo, okay, that's yeah. right. Because I remember watching it. This was during the heyday of the Crush Girls and Duck Matsumoto. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, as far as today, like, are you looking at like a pay per view or just TV? Oh, TV. You, you can't you can't get people to order a pay per view on a product they don't want yeah. or they don't know. It's just it's futile. I mean, I think you need to get you know. I don't I don't, I don't think that there would ever be. I don't think there's ever going to be a demand enough to where. And all Japan women, for sure, could ever get a pay-per-view and, and have anyone actually, you know, buy it in any, in any length of, you know, any great numbers. But I mean, it's just, it's just for, just for something on TV, you know. I mean, it's I, especially I we're know. talking about yesterday all the satellite, uh, satellite channels. I got 500 channels on my direct TV right now. Yeah. You, you think that most of them aren't doing hash marks? Yep. So I mean, this it'd probably do a hash mark too, but what the hell? Just get the tape, put the tape on. I don't know, Sheldon. So, what's what you? You know, they put, they, they show they show um they show soccer from every country in the world if you if you um have enough stations right right I mean, I mean I've seen soccer from Spain I've seen it from England I've seen it from sure. Germany Bundesliga you know so it's like I know it's all there so you know and there's and there's a lot more fans of pro wrestling in this country than there are of soccer absolutely you think that if that were available on some on some level and and marketed properly that it would attract an audience. That they would at least get somebody watching, you'd at least get an ECW size audience if it was good enough. No, it wouldn't even I, I don't even think it'd be ECW size, but you but it'd be something. Sure. Yeah. Without a doubt. Mean, I mean in a country of this size it just amazes me that there isn't more wrestling product of any kind, whether it's, you know, on all Japan women or a lucha product or whatever. It's just shocking to me that, that no one has has really broken through and offered uh, any sort of uh, other type of product that's a competing product. And I think that has a lot to do with what people's image of wrestling is. People sort of lump pro wrestling into that WWF category. If you ask people what, what's, what's pro wrestling, they're going to say, oh, WWF, and, and that's their vision of it. And anything other than it's, it's going to be hard for anyone else to break through that perception of it. Well, there is Lucha mm -hmm. every Tuesday night. Yeah. yeah. Dish. And if you live in the right cities that carry Galavision. Yep. So, I mean, that, that at least exists. That's one of the things that always surprised me is, is during those periods when wrestling was a real hot TV phenomenon, like right now it's kind of, you know, without a question, it's, it's one of its, its cooling off periods. Mm -hmm. But two years ago it was really hot. And then in the, in the mid, what was it, like 85, 86, remember when like there's a million wrestling shows in every market because oh, WWE, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, it was just it was just a hot thing again. Absolutely. I was always wondering, you know, why, and especially in, in the mid '80s, because in the mid '80s, Japan wrestling was was really good. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, why somebody instead of putting on, um, you know, one of those, you know, I don't know, rinky dink wrestling shows, you know, would just not try to bring something like that in. I mean, it was never really, it was never really tried. And then in the mid '90s, again, when uh, or I should, I should say a couple of years, not mid-90s, late-90s, right. um, when, when wrestling, when everybody was clamoring for wrestling product and there was so little right. that nobody tried something like that. You know, at least New Japan, because New Japan was still very strong. Right. What do you think we'll see first, like an independent wrestling channel, like, you know, just uh, someone sets it up and just tapes from everywhere, or uh, WWF doing the 24-hour WWF channel? WWF doing the 24-hour channel. Absolutely. think so? Yeah. They've yes, always been at the that, forefront of, of technology and new things. Um, well, I mean, that, that fight channel, you know, the, the thing is, is the fight channel idea, and I don't even know where that stands. I haven't talked to the guy in, God, it seems like six months. Mm -hmm. You know, his idea would was to include, you know, pro wrestling, boxing, and I could see I could see a fight channel where you include boxing, kickboxing, pro wrestling, shoot fighting, 
24-hour challenge, similar to Samurai TV in Japan, right. perhaps beating WWF, but pure wrestling, you know, where you would show old tapes and things like that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's if you could get, like, you know, the Bill Watts collection of all those old Mid-South tapes and the Vern Gagne collection and and all that, I mean, you could you could do it, and, it, I mean, it would be, you know, I don't know how viable it would be, but, you know, I mean, hey, there's 500 channels, how viable are all those? Oh, there's more than that now, probably, but yeah. how viable are all those channels? Sure. Yeah. Sean, what's your thoughts as far as the current wrestling scene? Boy, you know, it, it's funny. Every time I come on here, I always say that that uh, everything changes week by week. You know, uh, it, it 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 seems to be a different business week by week. I I, I only know what I've read about the the WCW situation, the the Fusion situation, and and I sure hope that, that goes through for the sake of this business. Um, it, it it amazes me that. Um, uh, well, I shouldn't say that it amazes me. I'd say that, that I'm, I'm I'm surprised that there there hasn't been some other um, strong contender to WWF. Maybe not even such a strong contender, but a serious contender, I guess I should say, uh, be it another independent promotion or just somebody putting up some kind of money for some kind of venture that would have some sort of impact on the national scene. And, and I don't think that, that it's going to be too, too long, maybe a couple of years before something like that comes about from somewhere because the market is so wide open for it. Um, but, you know, it's, a, it's really a uh, – you think about it, and on the national level, it's a really such a, a scary time in a lot of ways because well, – If you're uh, a wrestler. Excuse me? If you're, if you're a wrestler, it's a scary time. Unless, unless you're a top guy in the WWF. I think unless you're one of the top – Half of the WF roster, mm -hmm. you got to be uncertain because the bottom half, if something happens to WCW, the bottom half of the WF roster is in jeopardy. Most people in WCW are in jeopardy, except for, you know, a few guys that that are, you know, Booker T and Bill Goldberg. You know, I'm sure that, that they're fairly safe, but most of the rest of those guys are not safe at all. And then like, right. you know, so it's it's, it, and then you know when they're not safe, making this you know the same kind of money. Right. But, you know, I think even WWF has to be a little bit scared, too. And the reason I say that is that, you know, a certain measure of competition in the marketplace is good. I mean, they, they need other things that are similar to them in the marketplace. Even if they're not as big and even if they're not on the same level playing field, uh, just to, to have talent in the, in, in the pipeline for anyone, anywhere. Um, the fact that there was an ECW... I mean, so many of those ECW guys over the years went on uh, to bigger and better things, so to speak. Now, the, the independent promotions, by and large, there isn't an independent promotion in this country right now that has the resources and the media, expo and the media exposure to really be a factor. And uh, sure, there, there's groups that, that uh, put on good shows and that uh, turn out good people, but the only way that you're really going to make someone ready for that big national stage is if you have that that constant media exposure week by week, and if you have, uh, if you're running a circuit of venues, even if it's a even if it's a, a small regional circuit, because it's working and being on television and doing it week by week, that is the difference between you know just being able to go out there and do the moves and really being a professional wrestler in the polished sense of the word. I was going to ask you, do you think? I was talking to Bruce Mitchell last night. We were mm -hmm. basically talking about the future one year from now of wrestling. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be completely different than it is now, because God knows it was different a year ago. You bet. It's probably going to be different in two weeks. But mm -hmm. a year from now, if there's someone to challenge Vince McMahon, or I would say challenge him, because that may even be too strong of a word, but, but okay. another, another company coming in attempting to be a viable national company, right. okay, would you... Try to do a product like Vince McMahon, or try to do a product totally different from Vince McMahon. I think if you're going to be successful at this, you have to do something that is yours. Uh, whether it's the production approach to it, whether it's the stylistic approach to it, uh, you've got to do something that's uniquely you. If, if you go, if you try to imitate someone else, if you try to imitate the WWF product. All you're going to be is a pay limitation. You've got to do something that, that's yours and nobody else's, whether it's the specific talent that you use, uh, 
whether it's the style, whether it's whatever it is, it's got to be yours. And, and I think that people, and I'm, you know, putting my money where my mouth is because I'm out there trying to, to do something myself. Uh, I, I think people want an alternative. I'm, I'm not trying to say that I'm going to be competing with Vince McMahon. I'm not saying that, that my company or whatever I do is going to be on the same level uh, nationally as WWF or WCW or anyone else. All I can do is try to go out and put out the best product I possibly can, try to develop a fan base, and, and try to build it up little by little. And in thinking about it, you have to think of, uh, of different ways to accomplish your goal. You've got to figure out different ways to uh, be different from everyone else. And maybe that means uh, you you work with people from overseas who might want to get into the American market in some way on a small level. Uh, maybe it's uh, you talk to people in, in, in other industries that might be able to help you, such as uh, Internet-related industries that might do something that is somewhat similar to what you're doing wrestling-wise, but not quite the same, but but it's complementary to what you're doing on a business level. So I think the, the the person or persons who are going to succeed are the ones that, that really think about it and look at it and, and not try to imitate what's out there because fans won't buy it. Fans won't buy a weak imitation. Fans want to buy something good. And, um, and just give it your best shot and hope you can put together the resources and and, and be innovative enough and, and, uh, and good enough quality-wise to make it work. I think the important thing is um, you have to be able to compete, like, visually. I mean, if you have – it doesn't matter what your product is, but if you're going to go out there and try and, I guess, compete with Vince McMahon or be number two or whatever, you can't go out there with, like, really bad second-rate production. Mm -hmm. And I think if, if there was a group that had the money to have great production, I don't really know what kind of product that they should do to be successful. So I think that what has to be is – a group that has enough money to be able to experiment, mm -hmm. and if they're, you know, if something doesn't work, try something different. That's why I'm worried with the whole fusion thing. It's like, I mean, ideally, if that thing fell through and WCW were kept alive by Turner and they decided, look, we're going to keep this thing alive and we're going to do whatever we can, we'll put some more money into it, we'll cut some corners, we'll fire some people, we'll hire some new people. If that were going to happen, I would much rather see the fusion deal fall through than succeed because... Turner just has so much more money. Yeah. I mean, it's just going to be whatever company not, can try that, to beat these That's not going to happen, though. If, that, if that's the case and it's got to be Fusion, then uh, they're going to have so much trouble. Yeah, they, they've already real. tried to do it from within, and, and, and they can't do it. They don't have the people that, that have the wrestling savvy to, to be able to pull it off. Um, Eric this, Fisher, this, I, this, this, this Fusion. Yeah, I'm talking about Turner. Turner yeah, Turner's already shown from within that they can't do it. Yeah, uh, um, but this fusion. But Turner at least was successful during that period where they had Bischoff in charge, you know, for that brief period where he was just hiring everybody in. I mean, it wasn't anything that Turner had to worry about at the time. They they got somebody that at least for a little while knew what he was doing, and he made it successful. Right. And, um, you know, with fusion, I, if they have money to last a year, if they have to turn around within a year, that's just not enough time. And, and I don't know. I don't know all the particulars of the deal, obviously. But uh, who knows what they're saddled with? I mean, if you're buying a company, it's like it's like um, I was having a, a conversation with someone about why Vince McMahon didn't buy ECW, and and the short answer seven that I got seven million dollar debt. Excuse me. Seven million dollar debt. That's right. And if he wanted, That's the reason. He, he can get all the talent without having to, to saddle himself with the debt. And, right. and and the question is, is 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 just a name and old tapes worth it? And, you know, the answer to that is no. Well, Maybe. Not, not, obviously not to Vince, because Vince doesn't even market his own old tapes. Sure. Yeah. That's right. So why would he, why would he want to market Paul Heyman's old tapes? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the same question has to be asked about WCW. Is the name worth saddling yourself with all the obligations and uh, the talent? Well, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole key of why they're going to buy this rather than start their own thing from scratch is, it's not. It's probably not as much the name as Monday and Wednesday primetime television, which is a great starting point. True, true. I mean, they've got the one thing. If someone was going to start up, and this is like, if I had like one major bit of advice for people who would start up, because I've seen it screw up with the XFL, mm -hmm. and I've seen it screw up with with Roller Jam, and in a lot of other places, is do not go on TV for eighteen months 
Do not rush yourself on TV. Go around, go in these little cities, and draw no people, okay? Right. But get your people experience, and then when you're on, and make sure when you're ready to be on TV with a product that people want, that, that, that it's a good product. Absolutely. Then go on TV rather than go on TV and then do this XFL thing. We're a work in progress because once you go on that first week with big publicity, and everyone sees you, and they decide they don't like you, you're doomed, and there's very little chance of a comeback. If you go in there, and people are blown away with a good product, you're in a lot better shape. Absolutely. I, I can't agree with that more. That, that's why, uh, in, in my own little local situation, you know, we haven't done cable access or anything like that, because you know, we don't want to do it wrong. We just want to, you know, get to the, if it takes us a year, if it takes us two years, that's fine. But in the meantime, there's other ways to try to build a fan base and try to to, to get ourselves to a point where, um, you know, we're we're uh, we've developed something uh, than going right on TV right away. So. I'm going to get to a couple of emails here. This is uh, ask some questions here. Let's see, yep. what do you think will be the end result of this Jerry Lawler thing? He's either going to end up in WWF or WCW. I don't know which one. Maybe yeah. he's not going to end up without a job. I say and, and, it goes back to WWF. Okay. Uh, do you think WWF will bring in Jesse Ventura about Jesse Ventura? Let me say this because the name has come up. Mm -hmm. No way. Mm -hmm. There's no way that Jesse Ventura will be coming in. Yeah. I mean, it, it, just just he he, he could never. How, 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 it just can't be done. Right. You know whether he would want to or not. I mean the he he can justify going away on Saturday because it's 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 a weeknight day. He mm -hmm. cannot justify leaving Minnesota every Monday and Tuesday. Sure. To do pro wrestling. I mean, it, 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 he'd be aside from the fact he'd be um, roasted for 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 um, what's what's, what's it, um, deservedly. It just ain't gonna happen. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, ba -ba 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 There's something here. Uh, what is the most ill-advised face and heel turn of all time? Goldberg. Yeah. Goldberg and heel turn, face turn. Hmm. Uh, probably any time they ever tried to turn Rick Rude face. Rick Rude was one of those guys where. Where um, I don't I mean I don't know they never really well, I guess in ECW they tried to make him a face and people kind of liked him but Rick Rude was one of those guys to me that just couldn't be a baby face because you just looked at him when you look at him there was something about him where you just didn't like him yeah yeah uh, let's see uh, when are we gonna see a Sting return good question hopefully not Monday hmm. will Survivor Series in Montreal work or shoot with work each? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> what are you talking about? That question will be asked forever. Okay. Um, put it this way, Bret Hart was not in on the storyline. Okay? Shawn Michaels may have been in. The more I think about the more I think Shawn Michaels probably wasn't in on it either. But he might have been. I'm not sure about Shawn Michaels. I'm just, I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, it, Wrestling with Shadows was not a made-up movie, put it that way. Uh, let's see. Spider Lady was Lisa Sliwa. <laughs> Lisa Sliwa was, was like uh, in her mid 20s and she was a model. That'd be pretty <laughs> difficult to compare her to Moolah. I mean, when you locked up and go, this is not Lisa Sliwa here. <laughs> <laughs> How long do you have to watch a TV show to increase a rating? Uh, it depends on what you mean by increase a rating. To increase a rating um, by a tenth of a point, uh, that would be about. Uh, a tenth of a point would be. 80,000 homes for 120 minutes. Okay? So that's what that's what a tenth of a rating point equals. Hmm. Uh, I heard if you lift weights and your muscles are sore, it doesn't help you. Uh, mm, depends on... <laughs> what is that? You should be calling it the big show. Is that the health and fitness show? <laughs> calling Lizzie fit or something. No, it, dep it depends. You, I, I, that's not, as a blanket statement, that's untrue. What's the reason Phil Mushnick hates Vince McMahon? Is it because he stole all of Sam's talent? It's pretty clever. Aside from the fact that Sam and Phil are totally unrelated. Um, and uh, I guess the main reason would be that uh, Vince, Vince filed a lawsuit against uh, Phil Mushnick that was totally unsubstantiated. So that'll make you hate someone. Uh, let's see. For Sheldon, I heard of uh, NECW playing a tournament with international junior heavyweights. Anything to that? Um, possible. If not, uh, if not in May, then then sometime within the next year. Absolutely, we're going to do that. 
This is from Tom Ryan, who goes, After watching Matt and Lita against Crash and Molly, I demand that you and Brian retract your statements. This was Brian's statement, by the way, but that Trish is a better worker than Lita. I refuse. I refuse because you know what? On the basics in that match, Lita was not that good. No. No, I mean, like... I mean, Molly, uh, Molly did an awesome job with Lita. Yeah. And Lita... I mean, Molly... I mean, I mean, I mean and there's no question... Do a Hurricane Rana, but I mean, as far as basic, actual wrestling, she's not very good. Yeah. No, because I know like, when Lita was, like, doing the stuff besides the Hurricane Ranas, I was going, like, you know, Ryan's right. She's really pretty bad. Uh, let's see... Yesterday, I was watching World Championship Wrestling tape from the fall of 1983. Roddy Piper, Greg Valentine, and the Briscoe Brothers were coming in out of Atlanta from the Mid-Atlantic for the Omnicars to build up their arrival. They were showing Mid-Atlantic matches on TBS. In two of the matches, jobber Barry Horowitz was involved. Gordon Solian, doing the voiceovers of the Mid-Atlantic tape, on both weeks called him Bret Hart. That was the ring name he was using at the time. Did he ever wrestle with the ring name Bret Hart? Was Solian just confused by the real Bret Hart, who would also wrestle on TBS? No, that was um, when Barry Horowitz wrestled in the... Um, Carolinas, his ring name was Bret Hart, and Stu's son, Bret, who was already wrestling at the time, because there's a lot of confusion, people actually thought that that was Stu's son, and in fact it was Barry Horowitz, but, but that Bret outside of Calgary was not a big star. So, and then when Bret actually, the Mid-Atlantic Tapes, this is actually an interesting story, the Mid-Atlantic Tapes would air in Toronto because um, Frank Tunney, was, it, was Frank still alive or was Jack, do you remember when Frank died by any chance, Sheldon? Uh, not off the top of my head. I think, I think Frank may have already died, and it was Jack by then. Yeah. This is about 80, we're, we're, when we're talking about time frame, this is like 83. Right, 82, um, 83, yeah. Yeah, 80, 83, so, so this is before Jack went with Vince McMahon, because that was about 85, I'm thinking. Right. It was in the end of 85, maybe, maybe end of 84, mm -hmm. uh, when, when Jack Tunney went with Vince. But mm -hmm. Jack Tunney promoted Crockett stuff and did very, very well. Um, Toronto was, was a big hotbed with Ric Flair on top and everything. And they would show the Mid-Atlantic television show, but it would be called Worldwide Re I think the Worldwide Wrestling Show. It was called Worldwide. And, um, actually, it was called Maple Leaf Wrestling when it was aired in, in Toronto. And they would have a couple of local matches with um, you know, Dewey Robertson and Billy Red Lions and the local guys. And mix it in with the Mid-Atlantic shows with Steamboat and Youngblood and Ric Flair and those kind of people. Mosca was a local guy mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and they brought in Bret Hart from Calgary and made him wrestle under the name uh, Buddy the Heartthrob Hart because Bret Hart was a television jobber name. How about that, Bret Clark? Television. <laughs> That's only when Buffer announced it. Uh, there was wrestling on... Okay, let me just get, get this one thing and then we'll go to a break. There was a wrestling on WF last night, really, because all I saw was it's a two-hour program with five matches. None of them went longer than five minutes. Okay. See, you can't be writing these letters... Unless you know what you're talking about, the uh, angle match with Austin was a lot longer than five minutes. I think it was close to ten. So, see, and I got to throw the letter away. I was going to read the rest of it. You can say only one match had any length of time, but you can't. See, you can't do that. A lot of Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels emails. You know, we hadn't got them for a while. The Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels thing. I almost am afraid to bring it up. If you want to know what happened, serious, serious. The March 17th and 24th and December 1st issues of 1997, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, you will hear everything virtually uh, you ever would want to know about that situation in full detail, with the exception of the conversation that between Brett and Vince. And I actually got that, and I wish I'd remember the date off the top of my head, but it was in December, a uh, December 90, 1998 issue of the Observer. I got the whole conversation uh, before the, the the match in Montreal between December Brett and Shawn Michaels. It's in December 98, yeah, because it was a year later where, before I, when, when I put the transcript in. Okay. It was, it was uh, coincidental with the coming out of uh, the Wrestling with Shadows movie. Yeah. I hope okay. you have plenty of those uh, issues because you're going to be uh, getting a ton of people requesting them. Okay. I mean, but ser seriously, uh, the, um, I got, you know, it's all there. In fact, there will be a book <laughs> someday, <laughs> and it will have everything that happened. I'm going to have to write a book on this someday. I know it. but Actually, Bret Hart's going to write the book, but uh, Bret only knows some of the story. Um, he knows a lot of it, actually. But there's stuff that he doesn't know as well. Uh, let me see. Uh, from someone who goes, do you really believe Brett was smart enough to wear a wire in his meeting before the match? Yes, he was, because he did. Yeah. <laughs> and did you notice the camera never went to Shawn Michaels when Brett confronted him after the match? Actually, the camera did. It just didn't air. I, I know, like, when you love Jeff Merrick on the show, uh, God, who's Jeff on? Jeff's going to be on, not next week, but the week after. Jeff has actually seen all of the footage including Undertaker patting on Vince's door and all the stuff that was edited out of Wrestling with Shadows. 
including Shawn Michaels actually uh, crying in the dressing room, uh, which really happened. So anyway. Um, actually, you know what? I don't even know the website address, but whichever website has the Wrestling with Shadows video, I think the first article that you wrote with, like, the timeline. It has it, but it, it ha well, it, it was in the old Wrestling with Shadows website, which I think doesn't exist anymore because the company's out of business. Okay. But, but um, they edited that a lot because they changed my story to fit with the movie. Oh, they I did? Mean, oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, I didn't they, even know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, I read I it and I go. I retract the plug that I just gave. Yeah, I mean, I had a, a story and I read it and it was like, it, it's not so much different that I was ever mad about it, but it was like, you know, they had a, they have a movie story and, and there's, you know, and, and it wasn't wrong. It was just, you know, Paul J had, had, Paul J and I had slightly different ways of viewing the same facts. And he, you know, he had his, you know, his view was, was, uh, very, very pro Brett. Mine, mine was not, Certainly not anti Bret Hart. I think that Bret Hart was a victim of circumstances. But for those of you who will never be convinced that Bret Hart wasn't involved in the setup of this, I only have one thing to say: How come Bret Hart is not working for the World Wrestling Federation, feuding on television right now with Vince McMahon? In fact, why wasn't he two years ago or a year ago? And the fact that he isn't, I think that should tell you all you need to know. Because how much money is there to be made off of that, and why isn't it done if they were working together? Why would they both walk away from all that money? And he had the option to leave WCW at one point and go back. Well, he he had signed a renewal. They ended up firing him anyway. But but, but he had signed yeah, he had signed a new a second contract with WCW. Yeah. Why would he have done that if him and Vince were working together? You know, when he could have and he could have come back. And now, after he was fired by WCW, why is he not in the WWF? Yep. So so if anyone has if anyone can answer that question, answer. Anyway, Dan, Dante, you're first up. Dante. Dante. Dante is not... Okay, let's go to Scott. I think you didn't like that one. I don't know. Yes, sir. What's going on? I've been a fan since 1988. Okay. Are that's you there? Sense. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we're yeah. Good. I've been a fan since 1988, and I have to say I am disgusted with all the things that have transpired on uh, Tuesday afternoon out there in Tucson, Arizona. Mm-hmm. Cannot believe all that's happened. Jerry the King Lawler was an excellent person. He's uh, been with the WWF since 1993, and I think that the owner of the company should have done a little bit uh, more for him. What do you have to think about that? What do you have to say? I, I agree. I just I, cannot I, I, I believe that, that it happened like that. I agree that um, I agree that McMahon should have at least made more of an attempt. I mean, but it's but if you know McMahon, it's not a surprise. That's especially that's Vince. we just talked about Montreal. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, that's right. That's right. Like Montreal, think about that. Yeah, like, you know, think about that. I mean, that, you know, Bret Hart was with the company for thirteen plus years. Yes, he was. And was uh, the top guy in the company for many years. And you know, I mean, when it when he left, you know, I mean, it was like boy, he, you know, I mean, he, he tried to ruin his career basically. Yeah, he did. And, well, he he did. It actually backfired. It's just that the people who he went to. Didn't know how to take advantage of it, you know. I mean, he actually did Brett a favor with that thing, not knowing it, because it really did backfire because people noticed it. But then when he went to WCW, they didn't know how to pull the trigger on on something that was handed to him. So I, I blame that on WCW, not Vince. That's true uh, as well. Brett, as far as Brett's career. Yeah. All right, there, my friend. Thanks a lot for your time. You're very welcome. Thanks. Let's go to Jason. Hello. Hello, Jason. Am I on? Yep. Yes, you are. Okay, um, I've got a uh, question for you. Um, uh, a friend of mine and I are having a debate whether this wrestler existed um, by the name of T.L. Hopper. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was Tony Anthony. Yeah, he definitely existed. He definitely the, the, existed. The, 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 the um, plumber. What, um, what was the reasoning behind that gimmick? I mean, was it something um, everybody him, was or? Everybody was, like, out of their mind that year that was involved in WF booking. Remember I mean, that was that was remember that was the that, and the, the goon, the goon and um 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 the diesel and razor and the and the double J fakes. Yeah, they had a really that was a real trying year for that company. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened? happened? What what was happened that after? Right when Russo came in. No, actually, Russo came after this. This was right after, right before Russo. This was when they hit the bottom and Russo came in, and actually, say, believe it or not, saved them from this. What a strange world this is. It is. But he did, he did. That's right. Hmm. But yeah, that. I have another I question for you. Um, who was the first person that you know of, anyways, um, who used the green mist 
that the great Moody uses? Was that the great Kabuki? Was he the first person? Uh, the first one I remember would be Kabuki. Sheldon, do you remember anyone before Kabuki? No, Kabuki would be the one. I'll... Now, I got a question. Did the, do you remember the original great Kabuki, Ray Urbano, not, um, not Aki Samara? From, I, um, I, I remember I, I when remember I was. Him, but I never saw him. Okay, I remember as a kid the great Kabuki, so this is, well, I should know him because like my best, my best friend's dad, or one of my best friends growing up, dad was, uh, the great Kabuki. Mm -hmm. But, um, I don't remember him doing the green mist. Um, but he may have. But I do remember, obviously, um, I mean, uh, Kabuki doing the mist, you know, on Georgia Championship Wrestling and in, uh, world class in the early 80s, predating Muda by many years. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what I, uh, figured that he was probably the first. And my last, um, question that I have, uh, actually for all three of you is, <clears throat> what do you think, now that Jerry Lawler is, uh, out of the WWF, what do you think about replacing him with Al Snow? That name has come up so many times. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think, I don't, to me, Al Snow is completely underused, um, and I think there's a sense of humor there that just can be exploited, and they haven't done so. Mm. The Al Snow McFoley stuff was tremendous. Yeah. Remember I when remember he did Al doing a lot of commentary. I've and if he has, it really hasn't you know, stood out to me. All I remember is, do you know who was, was, was unbelievable? Was, now, uh, now, it was when Regal was doing the commentary of Al Snow matches that was the unbelievable, not vice versa. Remember? Mm -hmm. Hmm. But yeah, Regal, some of Regal's commentary was really good. Um, if I didn't like Regal so much in the ring and backstage, I'd vote for him. Yeah. Regal might be a good choice. I think yeah. that uh, if they I if they know. pick Regal though, that would take away from uh, his main event um, push that he's kind of receiving. Yes, yes, it would. Um, maybe because doing all that commentary, commentary you know, years, there's just so years. much. Um, Although well, that ahead. wouldn't fix their immediate problem, but that would provide something for for the future. What did you say? I missed. I missed what you started with that. I, I just said that maybe in the future, in a one or two years from now, that's something Regal could do. Um, although it wouldn't fix their immediate situation, it, it's it's definitely a um, solution they have for down the line. It could be, you know, like let's say like four or five years from now, when it's time for Regal to slow down, like as an active wrestler. Right. Uh, that wouldn't be the worst idea. Plus, you know what's interesting is look at all the debate about a WWF broadcast team. Yeah. And then look at WCW and the fact that it's like an afterthought to them. Oh, do we have a three-man crew this week or two? Oh, let's just put Tony in there. Let's put Stevie Ray. Let's put Hoovy. Even though Hoovy oh, was, was just entertaining so choice for a while. Hey, that was um, great for one show. Brian, Brian brings up show. a good point in Stevie Ray. Um, when he first initially started, I actually... Um, I liked him, and I know actually Brian did as well. And as time wore, went on, he just he went got downhill. worse and worse by the week. And my question is, do you think that if he wasn't working alongside um, Tony Schiavone, if he was working with a better team, he would be able to improve? Maybe. You know, a lot of this comes, everybody can be clever until they run out of their lines. You know, um, Harvey Whippleman, who used to be a manager at downtown Bruno, when he first came to Memphis, mid-'80s, um, he was, you know, had worked Pittsburgh Independence and nothing else was his first territory. And for the first month he was down there, I thought he was like the greatest manager, the greatest prospect that I'd ever seen. And then after a month, he'd used every one of his lines and he never came up with a new one. And he actually turned out to be a pretty crummy manager in the long run. <laughs> and, 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 you know, maybe Stevie Ray was like that. I, I never was a big fan of Stevie Ray, even from the beginning, although some of the things he said was kind of cute. But then after a while, you know, I don't know. That, remember that one that one interview with uh, Paige and Nash? What, oh, what a horrible bit of TV that was. Yeah, that was. Just, I was I just waiting even... for like the the lights to crash. You know, actually like on the air instead of just in the background and Nash turning his head. Oh yeah, my was, God! You you talked. Uh, uh, I guess it was yesterday. You talked about embarrassments uh, to pro wrestling. That was definitely one of them. Oh, uh, with all those <laughs> Scott Hall bleeps. Oh, yeah. What, that that thing ever made the air on a taped show. <laughs> yeah, that that was. Um, you definitely didn't want to sit down with friends of yours that aren't wrestling fans and watch that, and that 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 would they would just be laughing at you. Uh, or actually, they'd have sympathy on you. I will admit, I laughed really hard watching that. Yeah. In fact, I watched it like three times. Yeah. Well, I watched it twice because I couldn't but, believe uh, it the first time. It was pretty damn funny. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey. uh, I thank all three of you gentlemen for your time, and uh, keep up the good work. Okay. Uh, all right, this is Monday's Nitro.
Uh, let me see, what do we got here? Uh, Sean O'Hare is going to battle Lex Luger in singles competition. Oh, my That's going to get him over. They haven't God. figured it out. They haven't figured it out. I'm so upset. Even if he pins him. Colombo pinned him. It didn't help. Okay. Especially the way it was put together. Yeah. Well, Maybe you know bring what? Arn Anderson back and he can book the same match and they'll suspend him again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I understand storyline-wise, you know, because the rest of the building up to the pay-per-view. So that, you know, it does make sense in that regard, but... The, problems, the problem is, is that Luger doesn't put people over in a good way. Many wrestling insiders have predicted that Sean O'Hare will be the next, will be the next Bill Goldberg. Well, that's a way to doom him, for sure. <laughs> don't ever say that. Don't ever make, keep it on the Internet. Don't ever say it on television. The minute you say it on television, he's done. Air Paris and AJ Styles gives primetime Ill, Ill skipper and a mystery partner, who I believe is going to be Kid Romeo. It's, it's a match. Shane Helms and Chavo Jr. <laughs> Non-title match for the pay-per-view, so Shane can beat him. It's a great match. Good job. Conan and Lance Storm, and that's the only stuff that's announced so far. Um, wow. War Animal will be there, too, in a tag team, no doubt. With the Cruiserweights, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, let's see. Wade Keller is reporting that the WoW pay-per-view got 6,000 buys. What does that translate to in terms of a buy rate? Uh, let me see. I got my calculator here. Give me the numbers. Okay. He previously reported that Sin drew half the buys of the WoW pay-per-view. Is this true? Well, that's absolutely not true. The WCW pay-per-view did a hell of a lot more than 3,000 buys. Um, the, the, okay, 6,000 buys would be, okay, divide 6,000. Okay. Divided by 42 million. Seven thousand. No, 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 no. Okay, hold on. All right, point zero 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 one four. Ooh. Okay. Let me let me do this. Okay. Um, okay. A zero point one is forty two thousand buys. A zero point oh one will be four thousand buys. So it's zero point oh one four. Zero point oh one four. Zero point oh one four. Ouch. As opposed to zero point one four, which is probably what what. Uh, the uh, WCW Super Brawl did in the, in the neighborhood of. It's from Adam who goes, can you tell me how Bob Mould got invited, involved in writing for WCW and why did it end? Uh, Bob Mould, who was a pretty well-known cult uh, music figure, um, in fact, he was in, when he, in uh, the band Husker Du and everything like that, he is a long-time wrestling fan. There are people who I know that know him. I've met him, but I really don't know him well, although he subscribed to The Observer probably for you know, over 10 years. Um, they said he has a very good wrestling mind. Very So anyway, they brought him in. Um, he was friends with Gary Juster, and so he would have been brought in after the first Russo reign ended, so that would have been early last year. And as I, you know, he may have even brought in before that. I think he was actually brought in before Russo came in, the first time. And then Russo came in, and he had nothing to do, and he quit. And then he came back when Russo was, when they dumped Russo, they brought Bob, Bob Mould, said he wanted to come back because he couldn't work with Russo because Bob Mould's ideas were formulated by watching a lot of New Japan tapes, which obviously someone whose ideas are formulated by that is going to have a hell of a time working with Russo. So, so, so he came back and he was there until Russo came back and then when Russo came back again, he was gone again. So that's what happened with Bob Mould and that's how he got involved. And I don't know if he would have been good or bad. I mean, as I said, people who, have spoken to him that I know were very impressed with Bob Mould's knowledge of wrestling and how he handled himself in the meetings, but he never had any real power and, you know, never, so, so you just don't know. Mm -hmm. Next week on the show, Monday, Jim Cornette. Uh, Wednesday, we are going to have a tape show. I'm going to be gone Wednesday. We're going to air the show from last Friday. If you did not hear the show, I highly recommend you listen to the show because Brian was only the fourth funniest guy on the show, and that's very rare, uh, with uh, maybe third. I don't know. He, he was the funniest, and Don Fry was pretty darn close. Frank Shamrock's last line was pretty good, too. So those were the guests. And Brian Is was it pretty the fact good that, that Frank Shamrock started barking when he walked into the room? Get the <laughs> <place> right there. <laughs> well, the last line about, his, about Heenan and his brother, that was a classic. <laughs> that was better than anything Heenan said. <laughs> Anyway, but Brian was really good on the show too. But that one, that one about when he asked uh, 
when Don Fry was challenging all the shamrocks to a fight, and he goes, what about Bob? <laughs> that was so funny. By the way, we're going to have Ken Shamrock on on the 16th, right before he leaves for Japan for the uh, the uh, Pride Show. And also, uh, the Pride Show, Ken Shamrock, Igor Bovchanchin, uh, Kazushi Sakuraba against uh, Vanderlei Silva, and Henzo Gracie against Dan Henderson as the top three matches. That will air on pay-per-view, if you have a dish, on April the 6th, I believe is the date. So it's going to air in the United States as well. We'll talk about that. It would be better if it was on television, but that's another story. Uh, let me go through some of these letters. Uh, what, in your opinion, does Big Show have to do to get over? Um, I think he's got great fire as a baby face, so if they give him a big push, and he's got the size, but it would be nice if he lost some weight. Um, I guess they've given up on that one, though. It's just, yeah. a futile, it's just futile. Who was the mass superstar? Of course, that's Billy Eady. Is it true Greg Valentine once held the WF heavyweight title? Uh, the short answer is no, but they did an angle in New York where they held the title up with Bob Backlund and Greg Valentine, although it wasn't recognized in any other city. But Craig actually never won the title. Uh, have you heard of Brian Christopher has also quit? No, Brian Christopher is staying. Uh, what will the WF do when the fans chant, We want Waller on Monday? They won't. So I don't think they need to worry about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, I, uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it's, it's not highly impossible. unlikely. It's not impossible because, I mean, you know, they were chanting for Brett for a while there, too. Mm -hmm. just, um, I don't know what they'll do. They may, you know, the right thing to do would be to call them up. I'm not saying they won't. Uh, I don't know. What will happen to the WCW NWA tape library if the company sold to Fusion? Fusion will own it. Uh, let's see. Why was the Gary Steele match on the Zero One pay-per-view so terrible? I didn't see it, but I heard. I just heard it was terrible. Uh, let's see. Uh, now the time has passed. Do you still feel how Hogan left WCW was a work? I actually can tell you that I know the whole story, and it was 80% a work. The part that was a shoot was... Maybe, if there was a part that was a shoot, it was that they didn't know Russo was going to cut the promo. Everything that happened in the ring, I will tell you absolutely, was a work. I know it was how it was set up. I mean, it was. Now we're going to have more Bret Hart stuff. Even though Bret Hart was going to WCW, I think that since he didn't want to lie down for Sean, considering the screw job was away from the title state in the WF, and Bret to leave as uncrowned champion. Um, that would have been... Okay, first of all, Bret was very willing to do a job. <laughs> do, you, do you want to get into this? No, go ahead. So, you know, some show we should actually just talk about the subject rather than do it like and get it all out of the way. Brett was very willing to do a job, um, including to Shawn Michaels, as long as it was after Wednesday of that week, and he was booked. In fact, in fact, I should let me let me. There was an agreement made. Bischoff agreed to it. Uh, McMahon had agreed to it. Bret Hart had agreed to it. That on December the seventh of nineteen ninety seven, Springfield, they were going to have a four way. It's going to be Undertaker, Ken Shamrock. Shawn Michaels and Brett, and that Shawn Michaels was going to win that match and win the title, but Vince got Vince did what he did. Uh, let's see. How about Jason Sensation? That is, that is that's the best. That's a, that's a real good one. Yeah. Uh, Jason, Jason Sensation is uh, working in Memphis. I have not watched Memphis tapes since he's been there, so I don't know. But I know someone who's very well respected in wrestling, who's also Brian's grandfather, who went to Memphis and came back and thought that Jason Sensation was like the greatest thing in the world and that they should make him an announcer, in fact, a color commentator. So you're not alone in that thought. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. I can recall, this was Sean. I don't know if anyone remembers this, and it's not relevant to this discourse, but I recall a pay-per-view that Owen Hart did color on, and it was some of the most hilarious commentary I've ever heard. I remember that, too. But I guess it doesn't. Uh, let's go to Dan. Dan, what's up? Hey, Dave. Um, I, I want to talk about New England Championship Wrestling, but first let me throw out one other name uh, for the Lawler replacement. Bruce Pritchard. Not his brother Love, but his Bruce Pritchard. Well, he knows his business. Mm -hmm. Actually, I liked uh, what I saw of him in GWF. Mm -hmm. I, I, he was pretty funny. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I remember him with Eddie Gilbert. Yeah, he was good. All right. Um, but this is coming in favor. I want to talk about New England Championship Wrestling. Um, I saw the last show that you ran in Somerville. Mm -hmm. It was a great show. Thank um, you. I really, you know, there's some of the guys there that I've seen before, seen on tapes or seen in NECW. I'm kind of like, I didn't really like their ring work, but they really, I think everyone who I thought needed work kicked it up several notches. All the matches on there were great matches, I felt. Thank you. And uh, also, I wanted to say thank you for bringing this, because I look around the indie scene that's around here, and there's a lot of, 
um, you know, garbage leagues or whatever name that you want to put on them. You are, you know, and New England Championship Wrestling is doing wrestling, and I like that in my wrestling. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you for everybody, really. All the guys who who we have in the in, in the company really, really work hard, and, you know, uh, I know I appreciate them, so it's nice to hear that uh, people coming down appreciate them, too. So thanks. Yeah. Uh, do you know uh, what you're running up in Vermont yet, or...? Uh, I should have the card posted in the next 24 hours or so. We'll post the card on our website. Mm-hmm. But I think the main event is going to be uh, Slick Wagner Brown, who just won the title at the last show uh, against Jason Knight. That is going to be the main event. All right. So I'm wondering if I should make the drive up from uh, Boston to see it? Of course you should. <laughs> I figured you'd say that. Sure. <laughs> um, listen, um, I was reading on a news board you were posting about April Hunter. Mm-hmm. Um, how you're not going to use her anymore. So right. get, let me, um, if I can say. Go ahead. Excuse me? What happened? Uh, we had laid out a scenario for her, you know, in, in bringing her in. Uh, and we, we talked quite a bit about what she would be doing and what she wanted to do. And it was very, she made it very clear to me that she did not want to be a valet. She did not want to be eye candy. That she wanted to get in the ring and she wanted to wrestle. At the same time, she felt she wasn't ready to do that yet. And uh, what we had done is we had laid out a scenario to her of, of what we wanted her to do and where how we would get from point A to point B. And um, no, we told her that you know it could take as long or as short uh, a time as she felt comfortable with. But uh, what we wanted to do is give her the opportunity to get in front of. Of, of crowds and, and maybe learn some of the things that you don't learn in wrestling school, like how to play to a crowd and some of the more psychological aspects of the business. And uh, I guess uh, she just didn't want to go along with uh, a lot of the things that, uh, that that we wanted to do with her, and um, we sort of had a creative difference of opinion. And uh, you know, nothing against her, you know. Um, you no, know, I certainly. She didn't leave on bad terms. You know, we wish her the best and all that. But you know, we uh, and she didn't want to do what we wanted her to do. And you know, we just, I guess, agreed to, to disagree. Long and short of it. Because I was wondering about the uh, the Robbie Ellis match that show, uh, where you had the no DQ clause. Mm-hmm. It never came into play. Right. When that was set up, I was expecting, half expecting April to turn, and give Robbie Ellis the win, setting up her. Sort of as as his valet, and I was just kind of wondering, was that the original plan, or no, no? Actually, I'll tell you what the original plan was. The original plan was that um, uh, uh, we were going to pair her with Derek Destiny. Destiny yeah. was going to like pursue her, and finally, what it would come down to is that she would have challenged Destiny to a match, and Destiny would refuse to wrestle her, and uh, the angle would be that Ellis and one other person, and, and we were thinking about Kurt Adonis, would come out and attack Destiny, and then April would save Destiny, and then they would be a tag team, and that's how we were going to get her in the ring. But um, it, it would have worked. It would have. I think it would have worked well with uh, Derek Destiny's gimmick. Mm-hmm. That's a shame that didn't come off. Well, you know, <laughs> these things happen. Sometimes real life and yeah. things take precedence over over with the best laid plans. You just try to make the best of what you have. Yeah, I, 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 I fully understand that uh, you, you get put in these positions as a booker because uh, you got Mar- Maverick Wild. You've got the, you know, there's someone there who I think is ready for the taking for anywhere. But mm-hmm. yeah, I understand that he's got his his conflicts too. There's someone you should be using, mm-hmm. and you are using his, uh, you know, where you can. Yep. He's a great talent. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to. I'll get in and talk about ACW a bit. Okay. Appreciate that. No problem. Okay. Thanks. I got a question for you, Sheldon. Sure. What do you, what do you think of China's book? Oh, you know, I didn't buy the book. After I read about what she said about Kowalski, I didn't buy the book. However, I was in a bookstore last week, and I thumbed through the book, and I was looking, reading at some of the stuff specifically where she talked about Kowalski. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I, I was so soured on the idea that, that she would have any sort of, of uh, meanness towards him. I've known Kowalski for a long time, and, and he's told that story about China and, and how she got into the WWF for a very long time. So,
So I, I believe his version of it. I, I didn't have any personal knowledge of went on, what went on uh, and, and how, you know, whether what Walter says is the truth or not, but I can tell you that he's told that story for a long time, and I have no reason to doubt him as far as that goes. What I was really disappointed in is that here is someone, and, and you know, the things that she said about him were just so mean. I mean, it, it was almost like she was trying to be funny, but it came off as being something just totally mean, you know. I, it just it made me so sad to read that, not just for Walter, but for her. I mean, here's a person who, you know, one, one of the things that I learned a long time ago about professional wrestling is that nobody makes it by themselves. Nobody in this business gets any place alone. Whether you're in a match, you're, you're never in a match by yourself. You know, you, you never do anything in this business without someone opening a door for you or someone allowing you to do your best. And, and, and you know, it, it's very sad that here is someone who, who's become very successful uh, and and doesn't really acknowledge the person who opened the door for her. I think that's that that that's just shameful. I was very, very disgusted. I wouldn't pay money for the book. I was very, very upset about it, to be perfectly honest. All right. So. Um, actually, I kind of agree with you there. Yeah. This is from... Brian, remember what I, what I was saying about Waller and what you were saying? About? About people chanting his name? Oh, yeah. Well, you were right. <laughs> uh -oh. I'll tell you why. This is on Jerry Lawler's website. It says... Please show your support on upcoming WWF events. Chant King, Cat, and show plenty of signs. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody knew something I didn't know there. Hmm. And also, uh, I, actually, this is funny in a, sad, in a way. You know, uh, what was it the day before yesterday when Lawler did his big thing, his big you know rundown of everything that happened that we talked about? And at the end, he said, you know, please email uh, the writers. Because yeah. he figures that those were the guys. It was Bruce Pritchard, Jamie, um, Bruce Gortz. I don't even know what Jamie's last name is. Um, I think, but anyway, um, and you know, like uh, anyway, of course they blocked their email address and changed their email address immediately because they're getting all that negative letters. And you know, that was a pretty cheap thing for Lawler to do. So uh, Lawler is now telling everyone to please uh, call and fax. He's got the numbers of. Oh no. <laughs> he's got their their fax numbers. He's got the office. He's got. I don't know whose phone number this is. I don't recognize the phone number. Um, hey, it's Vince. It's not, no, I know Vince's number, and it's not Vince's number. No, then he really wouldn't be back. <laughs> <laughs> they were asked. Maybe it's uh, Val Venus's number. Remember that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, what do we got here? The problem with people wanting to compete with WF is that the lack of ability to integrate their new, their new ideas with the things that make the WF successful. For instance, the WF is successful because of the story. Each wrestler, in one way or another, has relevance to the other. They pay off the things they start, big or small. Well, not for the only. most part, but yeah. for the most part, yeah, yeah, the game in Triple Eight and Austin match, that was a great payoff, no doubt. Leading Dean Malenko, yeah, and it was even not even that bad. Stephanie and Trish, they did pay that off, and it wasn't that bad. But then they went one day too long. But they had something to do with it. But they had, and that was different. If it doesn't work, they get rid of it. But they don't insult their fans as they do it. Wrestling, one word that seems that everyone seems to forget is that in the definition, TV has to be smooth and polished. If someone brings down morale, you get rid of them. Well, they will do that, and uh, and they did. Give them and they did. Got to give them credit for that. The um, this is someone who is going like, uh, if you're any rumblings on either reckless youth or low key going to WCW? No, not at all. Um, I do know. What about American Dragon? American Dragon's under developmental deal with WWF, so he he ain't going to WCW. Uh, let's see. What about Dragon Kid, Shima, or Ricky Marvin? None of them will be in WCW soon, based on what I expect to happen, which can all fall through in many ways. In many ways, I would expect all of them to at least get the opportunity late this year. That may not happen. Again, there's, it requires, obviously, Fusion buying it. It, it you know, involves people being hired that I'm expecting to be hired. It also involves the company still being in business at the end of the year. And it also involves it involves many many things, but I, I think there's a a pretty decent shot at, at all of those guys coming into WCW. A decent shot. Uh, let's uh, see. Let's go to Dave. Dave, what's up? Uh, not much. How are you doing? Doing very good. Did you get that thing I sent you? Uh, tell me, because I get things you sent me. I'm like sorry. Every day. <laughs> Which one? The picture. Oh yeah 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 yeah. 
Yeah. Do you see the cat? Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, anyway, I, I really don't think that uh, Jerry Law... I think people are making too big of a deal out of this. Like, I, I really don't think people tune into wrestling to see an announcer. If that were the case... I mean, Jerry Law was with the WWF in 1995 and 1996 when they had their problems. But well, I, I think no, no, people are making... It, it's, it's not, it's, nobody expects the ratings are going to go down because of Jerry Law, or nobody tunes in... Because if it was just that, nobody would watch SmackDown because Michael Cole's terrible. But the thing is, is that... It'll it, hurt the it, quality it, of the product. It hurt. Yeah, it, it hurts the hype because Jerry Lawler knows how to hype because he's got 30 years in the business of hyping, and 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 knowing how to hype. And plus, you know, he's very quick-witted. So it, I think it hurts the product a little. I mean, it hurts the TV pr uh, presentation. I, I'm just afraid of seeing Lawler and Tony Schiavone, the, Schiavone together. I mean, if, if you look back at the history dreadful. of announcers that have gone to WCW and look at look at where they were when they first entered and look at where they were when they left. It's Jesse Ventura, Bobby Heenan, Mike Tanay. Yeah, you're getting you're like a good point there. Two years ago, Scott I remember Hudson. did that Nitro where he filled in for Tony Schiavone. I thought he was just excellent. Now I just can't, <laughs> can't even stand hearing this guy's remember voice. That? Remember that when he filled in and he did so great, he did better than Tony, and then he never got to host it again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they even did an angle to get rid of him. Yeah. yeah they did the, well, well, he was only brought in so they could do that angle because Tony has the bad neck and Tony wasn't going to take the... Well, it was the uh, Rick Steiner suplex, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So the only reason he was brought in was to do that angle, so he, because he was willing to take the suplex. So that's that's that you know, and the fact that he ended up being good, it was irrelevant because he was only in, in there to get beat up and shoved out. The thing is, I think it's very even if the WWF product isn't exciting, I think it's. I mean, I, I think it's the way it's worked out. I think you can get excited about it, but the WCW product. I, if I were an announcer, that'd be a tough job to get enthusiastic about that product. Do you, do you think you could do that? I don't no. think they do it. <laughs> they can't do it. No I mean, I mean, think, I mean, that's like, well, I mean, going from announcing WWF to announcing WCW, that's like going from eating at fancy restaurants every night to eating out of a gutter. I mean, that is that's gonna be a huge drop off, and I don't think he's gonna be as good in WCW if he goes there, based on the product he's calling. Well, if the product's the same product we've got, we've been we've been getting for most of the last couple of weeks. You know, I don't know. Hey, this could be an argument Eric that you're right. Of course. Him? What? Do you know if Eric What's Bischoff has, has contacted Jerry Lawler? Uh, I can't say I know, but logic would tell you that he has, yes. But I can't. I mean, I asked Lawler. He said no, it hasn't happened. But I got a sneaky suspicion. If it isn't directly, it has to have been indirectly. Every, everyone in wrestling knows how to get a hold of everyone, and everyone's got their little intermediaries. The, the thing that's interesting is they just got rid of all that woman all, or all those, all those girls. Do you think that they're going to hire the cat? Well, that's I, I, I interesting. Think they, I that's think they interesting. will, so they could get Waller. But I mean, is I that think they would get Waller too. Will that what will that mean for morale? Plus, here's another one. Okay, she goes there. If, if you know, if she, if she really is a morale problem, if that and, and and obviously there must be something, right? Or else right. they wouldn't have done. They wouldn't have done that. The last thing WCW needs is someone with a morale problem, right? And, and the one thing right. that I disagreed with when reading Waller's statement is, I really don't think of the cat as being a talent. I mean, she did that one nudity spot in Armageddon. Besides that, I don't think anybody really cared about her. Well, okay, it's his wife. What's he going to say? Well, well you know, that, you're exactly right, he's, he's going to pre preface the statement by going, you know, the cat got her job because she's she's a pretty woman, and I asked Vince to, to uh, give her a job, and they wouldn't give her any angles except for the ones I suggested and lobbed before, and they would finally do them. And then they stopped doing them, and I had to come up with new angles because nobody else was coming up with angles for her. The, the, way look, truth. the way I look at the cat situation is, remember when uh, Lanny Poffo was under contract at WCW to, to please Randy Savage? Yes, and, and, and Horace still Hogan, be. too. Although... <laughs> yeah, I, think they, I, think they, I think they finally cut him. <laughs> when, when did they cut him, actually? Uh, could he go like ago. two years without ever working for WCW? I think he worked like one dark match or something, <laughs> yeah. But hey, he was a genius. <laughs> yeah. he's, he's, he really is the smartest man in wrestling. Yeah, no, I just had the right brother. That's all. <laughs> but but the, the way I look at it is, the cat is worth. If you have Lawler on your roster, it, the cat is worth having. But using the cat, I don't. I, I think that may be more of a negative than a positive. I think it's, it's, it depends on the story. It's probably a wash. Maybe like, the thing is, that. I wouldn't have gotten rid of the cat, but I don't agree with Vince. I mean, I would take back Waller if Waller, con but I would not take it back 
It's just, it's just six back to Cat and Lawler. I mean, that looks like he's backing down to an announcer. So what, what happens when that happens? That's, that's, why, that's, why, that's why it's going to be real difficult for that to happen. I mean, do you think not, Lawler Not will, impossible, but difficult. I mean, do you think he will go back? What if they were to uh, up... What if they were to up Lawler's contract and give him everything the Cat was making and add that to his contract? I don't know. I don't know. That that would be interesting. But uh, what, uh, this is someone who wants to ask Sheldon about uh, how is Jeff Mangles doing, which actually I'm curious about that myself. Uh, I know he's having surgery in the not-too-distant future to take the, the steel rods out of his legs. Uh, he's walking pretty well. Um, I don't know uh, if he has a future in wrestling, at least as a wrestler. Um, he's working, uh, believe it or not, as a stockbroker. Really? Yeah. Yeah, oh, so right I'll probably end up that, working for him. Uh. <laughs> so every, real quick, Sheldon, because it's actually a pretty interesting story. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you tell everyone about, you know, what happened to Jeff? Jeff uh, was working on an independent show in Connecticut, uh, and he uh, was doing a spot, uh, which was a um, uh, moonsault off the top rope, and his opponent either missed him or walked away from him. And uh, he landed in, and, and actually broke both his legs at the thigh, which is uh, it's really hard to break your leg at the thigh, let alone both legs. Uh, he had uh, steel rods implanted in both legs, and uh, uh, basically for all intents and purposes, his career is over. And uh, it's a real unfortunate thing because Jeff was someone who uh, had had a couple of tours to Japan for a small group over there. Uh, he was making a lot of progress as a wrestler. And while he wasn't a big guy, I really felt that uh, that he had a real future because he'd been hanging around wrestling as a photographer since he was about six or seven years old. Uh, I, I met him when he was a little kid, and his mom was driving her to the matches. And here was someone who, who really uh, had a lot more maturity for the business and a lot more knowledge of it than most people do because all he'd done was, was hang around the top people, be it in the dressing room taking their picture or out at a restaurant or whatever. So, you know, for for him to suffer such an, an injury so so early in his career is really a, a, a tragic thing. You know what the McMahon trial he sat next to me like every single day? Yeah. I thought, you know, in in ninety four because he was like so how old was that seven years ago? So he'd been like twelve years old? Yeah. Yeah. Well I'm a really nice guy. Yeah. Good kid. Yeah. Real good kid. Let's go to Dan in Kansas City. Dan, what's up? Hey Dan, how are you? Doing really good. Hey, I want to talk about Lawler for a second. Sure. All right. Uh, I don't think he's going to be back, but I don't think it's because of the uh, because of Lawler not wanting to come back. I think it's because WWF doesn't want him back. And see, uh, all right. Well, my thinking on this is that Vince knew that if they released Stacy, they were going to release Jerry, right? So he may, uh, you would think so. All right. You, so, you, would, you would you would think that's a, that you would think so, but you don't know for sure. But you. There's a good chance you're right. I'll say that. Yeah, I'm pretty. Sure, uh, you know, I personally think he had to. Have Waller, Waller, by the way, Lawler thinks that as well. Yeah, yeah. And so I think I don't think no matter how much of an ego or attitude or whatever Stacey had backstage, that wouldn't be enough to lose your top color commentator for you know. So what I think is someone got in Vince's ear about this and said, "Hey, Jerry's a uh, liability. You know, we don't need him." And so instead of facing the backlash of directly firing Lawler. They did basically the uh, the slimy thing and fired Stacy. I mean, it's kind of a spineless and gutless thing, but uh, that's happened been, before in wrestling too. <laughs> so I mean, I don't know if it's direct because you know, I don't know if you read about what Vince said, but he didn't even try to persuade Lawler to stay. He didn't tell him, you know, hey, wait. Oh no, me. no, we didn't. Nope. He, it was almost like he had a speech already planned. You know, he just goes, well, thanks for everything you've done here. You've gone above and beyond. He just has it memorized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because he's done it so many times. Yeah. yeah. Sound like he's exactly calm and collective, so I think that's maybe one scenario that could have happened. But if if um, if Vince felt, uh, let's just go with with a theory, okay? Okay. Let's just say that uh, Vince felt that Waller was pressuring him by constantly coming up with angles for his wife. His wife wasn't appreciative, and he just, you know what I mean? And it, it, it could have been. Not as much he wanted to get rid of Lawler, but by that point he just didn't care. Because I'll just right. give you an example, like with, with Bret Hart in '97. He didn't want to get rid of Bret Hart, but by the end he really didn't care, and that's right. why he could be so cold because he didn't care, and that's why you know he can be so cold in this situation as well. Right, right. And I think uh, you know he's not going to get a lot of backlash if he was just to fire Stacy, because I mean, yeah, she's a good-looking girl and everything, but she doesn't have all that much talent in the ring or on the mic. 
And so, you know, if they fired Lawler, everyone would be like, well, wait, Lawler had talent. He was a great color commentator. He's been with your company since 93. So they decided to do it indirectly by firing Stacy. Very well could be. Thank you. That makes, that makes plenty of sense because ultimately, certainly you had to consider the possibility that if you fired Stacy, that it would be very tough for Lawler. Because it's going to, you know, it's going to be tough for Lawler. And they know that they put him in a position where it's, it's at best, it's going to, it's going to make him real miserable or he was going to just leave. Right. So, you know, certainly going in, I gotta, I gotta believe that they thought of it as a possibility. Maybe they thought that he would yell and scream and go home. But, you know, I mean, Owen Hart came back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Of course he had to, because he had to. And maybe they figured that because Jerry has to, in their mind, because there's nowhere else to go, that yeah. he will eventually come back. Maybe they think that. I don't know. I also get the feeling that maybe Jr. has more of a you know role in this than many think. You know. I mean, uh, the reason I would doubt it is because um, I mean, the reason I would doubt it is because what what does Lawler have to gain? I mean, they're as their personal friends. Yeah. You know, Lawler was the one who. I mean, it's not like Lawler was the one who got him his job back in that it was Vince's decision, but Lawler was the one who campaigned for it when there was an opening. You know, like let's bring in Jr. Right. So it's like, I mean, why would Lawler? If, if, you know, if, if, like, Lawler and King were having personal problems working with each other, yeah, you know, it's possible, but they weren't. And, and, and you know, it was, I, 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 mean, I mean, it's like... Plus, what upside is there I, I, for I, I just don't, I, you know, it's like, I, I, don't, I don't see, you know, now Ross has to work with somebody else and nobody knows who that's going to be. Right. And, and whoever it's going to be is probably going to be a drop-off unless, unless Heyman shows up on Monday, which could happen. And if, Heenan and Cyrus. What? Heenan, Heenan. and Don Callis. I don't think this Callis will come in, but but I mean I, I, they weren't they weren't they've never been that fond of Callis. But if 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 Heyman shows up on Monday, then I would say that it was all a plot and they were all you know, or, and a lot of people were in on it. If it's Taz, I think that they were not ready for it because you know I mean Taz isn't isn't ready for that spot yet. Right, right. Uh, could be you know could be we, we may see Heyman if we see Heyman on Monday, then I'll say you know th th it'll be real. Uh, if we do that, then we'll, it'll be real obvious what this is at that at that point. What do you think of the likelihood of Heenan? I mean, he's not really doing anything. Not, he, not Heenan, Heyman. Heyman. What's that? Heenan, Heenan hasn't even been... He, Heenan hadn't even been... I shouldn't say, because I, I don't know as of today, but as of yesterday, Heenan had not even been called. Oh, And okay. when it came to um, whatever it was, when, he, when, Heenan, when Heenan was let go by WCW, he called them, they called him back one time, they never even brought him in for a tryout, they at least brought Zabisco in for a tryout right. and didn't hire him. They never, he didn't call a couple more times and they never called him back. So they had no interest in Heenan, you know, when they had a chance to get him. So I don't, they may, they may now. So just you're talking about Heenan? Heenan. <laughs> <laughs> if Paul Heyman shows up Monday, that's what we're talking about. If Paul Heyman shows up Monday, I think that there's a good chance this was all, that Vince knew what he was doing exactly. Well, yeah, if you look at the last week and, I mean, Lawler's time on the TV, you know, Raw, SmackDown, pay-per-view, they had Taz come in for the last half of every show. So something was yeah. going on before this. No, but that, that, that made total sense, though. They couldn't have, they couldn't have Waller go out there, on the pay per view, and on the TV show, um, because of the situation. Um, you know, Waller was going to be wrestling on those shows. Waller, Waller booked those things himself, and it would have made no sense for him to wrestle. And on the pay per view, he couldn't come back out because he'd gotten beat, and he would have to. The only way he'd come out is do a promo, and they wouldn't want him to do a promo because that would detract from the the Rock Kurt Angle match. He should be calling the Rock Kurt Angle match, so it wouldn't have worked. Right. I mean, the logic wasn't there for that, and and Waller. Waller was involved in booking all of that stuff, so so that no, no. But I mean, if it's as like I said, if it's Taz on Monday, uh, I think that they were unaware because they didn't have someone ready. If it's Heyman on Monday, I think that we could look back and go, okay, that's what this was. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. All right. Let's go to Mark. Mark. Gentlemen, how are we doing this evening? Very good. Uh, First off, I know we're all sick about talking about Lawler, but you know what? I think we're missing the most obvious choice for color, you know, color analyst or, or color commentator. That's you, Dave. It would be me? a perfect fit. A, <laughs> Brian would be better than me. Brian's no, much Dave, funnier than I am. It's a smart audience. It's a much different business than it was five years ago. You would be the perfect counterpoint. You're articulate, witty, you know, great in work. Right by Michael Cole. <laughs> That's right. And you can get that perplexed look that Michael Cole has over for two straight hours every Monday. I get that look I had when I was on the air with um, with uh, uh, Burt Randolph Sugar for that half hour on Court TV. <laughs> when I was rolling my eyes at everything he said. Oh, my gosh. Since we have uh, Mr. Goldberg here being the historian of the business that he is, I think it's apropos to ask a, uh, a historical question. And uh, 
Tonight I want to go back to uh, September 22nd, 1979, the uh, the Garden uh, uh, Backland Race NWA uh, w- WWF uh, title unification match. Uh, mm-hmm. Just curious, that was like the one MSG show in the 20, 25 year contract, 30 year contract with Titan that was not uh, shown on the uh, network. And I was wondering what the politics are behind that besides the obvious fact of, uh, I think Backlund won it on a DQ, but why not allow it in NWA territory, which WWF was, to air that footage? Uh, I think they stayed away from showing the NWA champion whenever the NWA champion was in the uh, on television. I think they did it more for for political reasons rather than than anything else. Now I saw I saw on MSG Network. I remember as a kid seeing Harley Race and, and Dusty Rhodes. And that, that was on. That was on uh, nine months before. But the unification. Right. I, rem- I remember that match vividly. It wasn't even that good of a match either. No, but the unification belt for some reason is part of the deal. And the, the big catcher here is that the WWF was a card carrying dues paying member of the NWA at that point. Didn't they yes, have they the right to show that match? I, I don't know the politics. That's you know, 21 years, 22 years ago. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't I, I, you know, I never knew that match never aired. I just but now no. you bring a, now you bring it up. I actually never saw that match. That was the only show that never aired. Um, wow. Yeah. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know what? There was another show in the mid 70s. Okay, where they were supposed to have, and I don't know what the politics about this was either. There was a show at the Garden in the mid 70s that didn't air on MSG, and Vince Jr. announced a show from the Omni because I remember seeing. It's like uh, Mr. Wrestling 2 and Jay Strongbow and all those guys, right. on, like on, on, a, on a tape, and I never knew what, what it was. So, so I know there was, an, there was another show, I, but, but I don't know what the story was as far as that show goes.